Some of you might have seen an op-ed that I had Saturday in the New York Times. Um, I stole, stole the title, or they stole the title from the subtitle of my book, I guess, um, How to Build Artificial Intelligence We Can Trust. And it started this way. It said, artificial intelligence has a trust problem. We are relying on AI more and more, but it hasn't yet earned our confidence. And the book is really in part about why I think current AI, and I should say Ernie Davis and I, my co-author, why we think that AI is really not as good as people think that it is right now. Um, so one problem is this trust problem. We're using AI before it's really valid, and I'll talk about that uh, in a moment. And AI also has a hype problem, and I'll talk about that today. Um, and I think that the two are related, that because AI is frequently hyped, people have come to trust it when maybe they shouldn't. Um, so the hype problem to me is captured by this quote from one of the most famous people in deep learning, which is one of the most famous strands of AI right now. Andrew Eng, writing the Harvard Business Review, said, if a typical person can do a mental task with less than one second of thought, we can probably automate it using AI either now or in the near future. He wrote that a couple of years ago. I don't think it's true at all. So there are some things that people can do in a second that AI can automate, and there are other things that it can't. And I'll, I'll give you some examples. Um, but when the Harvard Business Review tells you that AI is about to automate everything that people can do, First of all, we get panic. People think that they're going to lose their jobs. We get terror. People think that the robots are going to take over the world. Um, and we've got some in misinformation that I'm going to try to clear up. Um, here's an example of the trust problem. People were promising that we would have driverless cars by 2020. Um, if you read any car, uh, sorry, any article n now that says driverless cars are here, I promise you that by the fifth par paragraph they will acknowledge, that, well, the driverless cars we have now aren't really driverless. We have safety drivers in them. Um, and sometimes the safety drivers are ordinary people uh, sitting in their Teslas and they fall asleep and their Teslas crash into, um, what is it in this picture? I forgot. This is a stopped fire truck on the side of the road. It turns out that Teslas have a problem with stopped vehicles, mostly emergency vehicles, on the side of the road. So they have run into, in the last year, three fire trucks, a tow truck, um, a police car, and so forth. So you should not be trusting a Tesla. Elon might get on 60 minutes and take his hands off the wheel, but you should not be doing the same because the technology is not really there yet. Um, similarly, if you have a security robot, you shouldn't really trust it entirely on its own. Um, this is one from Knight Robotics um, taking a bath that I don't think was um, part of its intended uh, instructions. Um, then there are, are all kinds of bias problems. I'm, I'm doing an event tomorrow with Kathy O'Neill who wrote um, Weapons of Math Destruction. She, she has many, many examples. This is one um, of our own, I guess, that, that we mentioned in our book, um, which is if you do a Google image search for professor, you get mostly white people, um, whereas the statistics are that only 41% of professors are white males. So um, here in this particular case, the problem is really that you have machines that have perfectly reasonable algorithms that have no idea what data they're sampling. So they just take random pictures. Google Image takes random pictures that are labeled professor. Some of them are from movies. Some of them um, might be from you know, 1910. They, they could be from all over the place. You might have in mind that I want pictures of professors now, but Google Image Search doesn't know that, and there's no way of thinking, is this a reasonable sample, a representative sample, and so forth. Um, so blind devotion to data is not necessarily a good thing. The underlying problem in most of why I don't think we should trust AI right now is that the current techniques that people are using are simply too brittle to earn the trust that we're giving them. Um, so the main technique that most people are using right now is deep learning. Um, and I guess I have a, a graph to show you in a minute, but probably how many people here have heard of deep learning? I'm guessing it, it's, it's nearly everybody, most people. Um, so um, deep learning is used in a number of ways, but the primary way that it's used is you have a bunch of labeled examples and then you have to identify things that do or do not belong into the categories you've seen before. So object recognition is a typical application. So you show it a lot of pictures of chairs and bottles of water, and then you show it a new picture, and it says whether it's a chair or bottled water. So you have examples that teach a system. It learns for itself at some level um, how to identify more things like that. Um, it's used in face recognition. Um, sometimes, as, as we pointed out the other day, it may misidentify people like Congress people as convicted criminals. Some people might argue that they should be convicted 
convicted, but I'm talking about ones that have not, in fact, been convicted, just to, to be clear. Um, so you have um, relatively high false alarm um, rates with these things, and if you think about rolling them out on industrial scale all over nation, it gets a little bit scary. Um, another technique is speech recognition, and you know the fact that Siri <coughs> or Alexa can understand your syllables is primarily because deep learning is very good at recognizing categories like words, and so um, that's revolutionized the field um, of speech recognition. Deep learning has played a role in the great performance in games like AlphaGo and, and um, so forth. Um, it's played some role in radiology, although that hasn't become commercial yet. Um, but these successes are ex examples of one thing. They're all examples of what a cognitive psychologist would call perceptual classification. And that's part of what we do as intelligent human beings, but it's not all that we do. Um, and deep learning has, actually has a lot of limits. I was first wrote about um, some of these, well, many, many years ago, but in particular, um, an article last year called Deep Learning, a Critical Appraisal, which Wired summed up this way, greedy, brittle, opaque, and shallow, the downsides to deep learning. And we reprise all of that um, in chapter three of, of this book um, and extend it a little bit. So part of this book goes through some of the problems with, with deep learning. Um, because deep learning is greedy, requires so much data, um, and not doesn't really have a depth to the abstraction that it makes, there are actually limits to it. So when you think about Andrew Eng's quote, and then you have some commercial job you'd actually like done, I'd like you to think instead of this, which is, if a typical person can do a mental task with less than one second of thought, and we can gather an enormous amount of data, of directly relevant data, we have a fighting chance. So long as the test data aren't too terribly different from the training data, and the domain doesn't change too much over time. So the, the signature examples of where deep learning works well are cases like speech recognition, where an enormous amount of data has been labeled um, by people working for Amazon Mechanical Turk and similar, um, and things like Go, where the rules haven't changed in 2,500 years, so the situation is really stable. So if I want to train a deep learning system to recognize the difference between Tiger Woods and Angelina Jolie, I can get a lot of pictures, I label them, the system does very well using um, a neural network network like we have um, on the right of the diagram. And crudely, um, you can just think of it as big data goes in, you make statistical um, approximations. But there's also been a lot of hype about it they think hasn't really been delivered. So um, here's an article about deep learning in 2015 in Wired um, saying deep learning will soon give us uh, super smart robots. Well, it certainly has not yet given us super smart robots. I'll give you some examples later. Um, and there are lots of cases where the test data aren't like the training data. So I train you on a lot of pictures of elephants like on the left. Left, and now I show you um, a picture of an elephant on, or sorry, on the right, and now I show you a picture of the elephant on the left, and the deep learning system says, person? Because um, it has no idea what a silhouette is. And so that's an unusual position for an elephant. A person would recognize the trunk. That's kind of a dead giveaway. But deep learning doesn't even really fully understand the relations between parts and holes. Um, it certainly doesn't understand what a silhouette is, and it gets it wrong. Um, there are all kinds of examples. There's a whole field now of kind of adversarial examples of deep learning. So um, another of my favorites is this uh, uh, bus that, that is turned on its side in a, in a snowy road. And deep learning says, with considerable confidence, I might add, snowplow. Um, or here's another example. There's a baseball that's been, this is actually a three-dimensional uh, baseball. It's been 3D printed, um, if I recall correctly. And there's a little bit of foam on it. And deep learning, it mostly cares about texture. The texture there reminds it of an espresso. So it says with confidence um, that it's an espresso. But you and I can tell um, that it's a baseball. If there are any androids in the room, they might be confused. Um, here, here's another example. Um, you can show a deep learning system the banana at the top, and it will correctly classify it as a banana. Then you put this psychedelic toaster sticker next to it, and now it says toaster. Now, a human being is not going to say that that thing is a toaster. Even if you're in the front row, you're not. You might say it looks a little bit like a weird sticker of a toaster in front of a banana. But deep learning can't do what we call compositionality. It can't put ideas together. It just picks particular categories. So it's forced to say either banana or toaster. Um, the, the psychedelic thing is a little bit brighter and has more contrast, so it likes that one, and it says toaster. That's, that's really kind of weird. Um, here's another example. There have been, people have been doing captioning lately. So um, the, somebody released a data set, so people trained the, these models. Um, and they were pretty good at captioning some things, but sometimes you get things that remind me of Oliver Sacks and the man who must took his wife for a hat. Um, here's Deep Learning's answer was a refrigerator filled with lots of food and drinks. Um, or here's another example. Deep learning might be able to tell you that there's a dog here. It might be able to tell you it's a barbell, but it's certainly not going to be able to tell you that, wow, that's really weird how the dog gets so ripped that it could be lifting that barbell. You might be able to do that or at least understand why it's funny. 
Um, I brought my friend Ken Perlin to laugh at my jokes. Thank you. Um, uh, so um, those are all examples of vision, which is the sweet spot of what deep learning can do. Well, what about reading? There's, there's been talk about reading, but I think that deep learning doesn't just fail on reading. It completely, entirely misses the point. So um, I don't know if I'll be able to sort of read this whole story in its entirety. Um, there's an article today by me and Ernie Davis in Wired where you can actually get the full text this, or you can buy the book afterwards and get the full text that way. Um, the less economically efficient way to do it, your choice. Um, and so th we have a children's story by Laura Ingalls Wilder who wrote a Little House on the Prairie. Um, and a, a nine-year-old boy finds a wallet that's on, full of money on the street and the father guesses that this thing, which they called a pocketbook back in the day, what we would call a wallet, might belong to Mr. Thompson. So little boy, Almanzo, finds Mr. Thompson at one of the st stores in town, and then we have an excerpt of the story. So Almanzo turns to Mr. Thompson, and he says, did you lose a pocketbook? Mr. Thompson jumps, and you as a human being can guess why he jumped. He's, he's surprised. Um, he slaps a hand to his pocket and fairly shouted, yes, I have. You can make the inference. How did he get from slapping his pocket to realizing that he lost his wallet? Well, you realize that we carry money in our pockets and that we can feel our pockets. You have all of this kind of common sense knowledge. I think I won't go through all of the story now because you can read it later, um, but the point is you can then answer a whole lot of questions like why did he slap his hand, uh, slap the pocket with his hand? Um, did he realize his wallet was missing before um, he went and did, slapped his hand? Um, all of these kinds of questions. What was Almanzo referring to when he asked, is this it, when he comes up and says, you know, is this your wallet? Um, I mean, I gave it away now. You could do these offline. Um, who al almost lost $1,500? So all of these things are trivial for people, and each one of them requires that you make a chain of inferences. So he was asked, why did he slap his pocket? And we sort of already went through some of the knowledge that you have as a human being about the everyday world and how you work all that out. Um, the best things that we have now in natural language understanding, the ones that have been really hyped this year, are ones that predict the next word that comes in a sentence. They don't do any of this. You can't actually ask them who did what to whom, why did they do it, what was their motivation, what were they expecting, um, anything like that. But I thought it would be fun, as I was writing this um, adaptation for Wired, to take the system that came out after the book went to press um, you know, to see whether we were still right in our skepticism. Um, and so we looked at OpenAI's GPT-2, which is the system some of you have heard of earlier this year, right? OpenAI, founded by Elon Musk to be open, made this big statement, our system is so good, we will not release it to the world. Ooh, scary. So, so, so GPT-2 is so scary, but somebody implemented it eventually, it's not that hard. Um, and I, I fed in the Almanzo story up to the point where the guy counts his money, finds that um, none of it's missing, um, he's very excited, and then the output of this thing, right, it takes a story and then gives a continuation was it took a lot of time, maybe hours, for him to get the money from the safe place where he hid it, so he brought it back in a bundle and left it on a table. It's totally grammatical and totally incoherent, right? If the man just found his money in his wallet, he's not going to go find a safe place, but it happens that the words wallet and safe place are correlated, and these systems are just giant correlation machines. They have no understanding of causation. Um, so the second half of the book, after we go through a lot of depth to try to persuade people that AI really has gone in a wrong direction, or partly wrong direction, is to look for some clues. Um, the first one is stop looking for silver, silver bullets. There's been a history in psychology and now in AI of people trying to find the one magic equation that explains all of psychology or does all of AI. Right now it's the back propagation um, equations that drive deep learning. But if you look at it from the perspective of a cognitive psychologist, and I am first and foremost a cognitive psychologist trained by Steven Pinker, um, perception is what deep learning does. And actually it only does a small part of perception. There's lots of parts of perception where we use our knowledge about the world that it doesn't capture. And then there are all these other things like common sense and planning, analogy, language, and reasoning. And deep learning doesn't happen to do any of those. It's great for perception. We should use it. Thomas is using it to do a kind of perception um, for, for his control lab stuff. And it's terrific in that application. But there are lots of other things that go into intelligence. So um, in, in the critical appraisal I wrote, um, I said, despite all the problems I've sketched, I don't think we need to abandon deep learning. I'm not saying it's a terrible thing. I'm saying it's like a hammer, and a lot of people are trying to treat everything as a nail because they have a great hammer, when we actually need some power screwdrivers and planes and blueprints and all kinds of other stuff to go with it. So we shouldn't throw it away. We should use it, but we should understand its strengths and its limits um, and not look for, for a single... Uh, solution. The second is there's no substitute for common sense. This is an earlier 
paper that Ernie Davis and I wrote about common sense that was in a major computer science journal. Um, we didn't make this picture, but I love it. It's a robot sitting on a tree, cutting down the wrong side of a tree limb. If you are a human being with some familiarity with the uh, physics of trees and, and chainsaws, you'll realize that this is not a good idea. You will also realize that a common technique called deep reinforcement learning, in which you do things trial and error, sometimes millions of times, probably not the right solution here. Um, here's another example of common sense. I can show you this thing, and I can tell you it's called a yarn feeder. You've never seen one before, probably. Um, but you can, as soon as I tell you what it is, you can figure out its function. Um, you can figure out what's the causal role of that hole that some yarn is sticking out. Why, why do I have this thing? And you can recognize another one, even if it's butt ugly, um, and pixel for pixel, totally different. But you understand immediately the causal um, <coughs> nature of the geometry underlying and what it's for. That's common sense. Um, Roomba doesn't have it. It can't tell the difference between Nutella and the stuff I have on the right side of the figure, um, and that has led to um, a disaster um, that has happened a lot called the Poopocalypse. Um, right? This hasn't happened just once, but many times as a Roomba. I should say that my co-founder, again, is Rodney Brooks, who co-invented the Roomba, but he's good-natured about me showing this slide. Um, and In fact, the point of the company that we formed is to add common sense, which the Roomba lacks. Um, and you can think of the Tesla thing as an example of that too. So we have enough common sense to realize that a vehicle could be stopped on the side of the road. Even though most vehicles go quickly on the road, there can be reason to stop on, on a highway. Um, the third lesson I would say is that learning isn't just about big data and number crunching. So almost everything that you see in AI, particularly machine learning right now, is let's get a bigger database, a faster set of GPUs, graphics processing units, and see what we can do with that. But there is another approach. This is my daughter about a year ago. Um, this is a reenactment of the amazing thing that she did. It's the second time that she did it. We were sitting at a Whole Foods in Vancouver, and um, we, there was a chair that had a gap between the bottom of the chair and, and um, the, the back of the chair. And she set for herself a goal. So this is learning through exploration, problem solving, and intuitive understanding of how the world works. So she had never seen anybody else do this. Her brother was too big. I'm too big, I'm sorry to say. I couldn't fit. And she had never seen the Dukes of Hazzard, she, so she didn't know that it's possible to slide through the window of the door for anybody who watched that old television show. So she came to this all on her own. Um, and, and so you know, I took pictures the second time she did it, and she didn't do it perfectly. She actually got stuck. And then she figured out how to wiggle around and get through. So she used some causal reasoning, not consciously, but about the physics of her own body in order to do problem solving and, and figure out what have, has to happen. It's totally different from trying things a million times, which is what, say, AlphaGo does when it plays Go. Um, Fourth lesson from cognitive science, we actually have 11 in the book, but um, is common sense probably starts with an innate understanding of time, space, and object. This is Liz Spelke, one of my favorite developmental psychologists, and she has been making an argument similar to what Chomsky and Pinker have made about language. She's been making about having a basic understanding of the world. So nobody is saying that you innately know what a microphone is or, or what a you know, presentation remote is. But the argument is you might innately know um, from birth, or, well, we go into that in detail, um, but essentially from the moment of instruction of your brain, um, you might know that there are objects, that are, what objects do, among other things, is they persist in time. And then you could learn about the particular objects. You might be born knowing about space. You might be born knowing about time. It's essentially a position that you can trace back to Kant and Plato um, in, in, in some ways. And I think she's exactly right about it. Nobody ever believes me, though, when I say there's innate stuff in people. So I'd like to show this video of an ibex, a baby ibex, a few hours after its birth. Um, you can't watch this video and not think that there's something innate um, about space and time in the baby ibex. I, I guess we don't have the sound here, but we can live without it. Um, the, well, we'll, we'll, we won't have the um, Richard Attenborough or whoever it is intoning, but um, you know, the, the baby ibex cannot do this as reinforcement learning over a million trials. You can talk about natural selection and how that has shaped the innate endowment um, of, of the ibex, but there is something built in that allows it to do this after a few hours. Um, and you know, by way of comparison, fair, in fairness, <laughs> this is what happens when you don't have a lot of innate stuff. Mm -hmm. It's more fun with the ragtime music, but I forgot to warn you about the sound. Anyway, um, so to, to recap, and then we'll, we'll do some Q&A. Um, in the event of a robot attack, close the door. Or if things get really rough, lock it. You'll be fine. Um, hide behind a bus, dress like a bus, or hide behind a shiny toaster. Um, keep a pack of psychedelic stickers on hand, or just talk in a noisy room with a foreign accent. They'll never understand you. 
Um, and second, deep learning is a better ladder for sure, but a better ladder doesn't necessarily get you to the moon. We really need some new ideas. Um, if we want to build machines that are as smart as people, we should start by studying small people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, congratulations on the release of the book that came out today. The book came out today. This is my first public presentation of the book. Thank you all. Thank you. We, we're very honored. <laughs> now, I read the book. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I very much like this presentation. It's uh, both uh, enlightening, but also uh, really, really funny. Um, and, you know, the last point about uh, how to look for the always saying that in the world that we have, I think, is really good. One of the funny points. My words, not yours, but almost like collective hysteria about uh, the dangers of AI. And uh, you know, like one sentence I liked where somebody was saying, you know, uh, people are not focused enough. It's as if people in the 14th century were worrying about traffic accidents when good hygiene might have been a lot more helpful. One of my favorite lines in the book. <laughs> yeah, that, that was very uh, well, well done. Um, but maybe just to play. Uh, devil's advocate on, on, on deep learning. So one, one counter argument is, you know, you use the, the word like AI are idiot sa uh, savants, uh, just uh, able to do one thing, but like nothing, nothing else. And effectively deep learning is brute force, like statistical powering through massive amounts of data. I guess the, the, the question is, does it matter as long as it achieves its end goal? I mean, you know, the, it, I think the, the argument is, um, you know, planes for air travel are a prime example of just brute force. There's nothing that they do that's close to what a bird innately knows how to do, yet it works amazingly well. In fact, m you know, much better than a bird. So does it does it matter it, how it's done? It only depends. I mean, it matters depending on what your problem is. So. If your problem is a closed problem, like Go or chess, where the rules haven't changed, there's a limited number of options, then you can use brute force. I mean, you can either use the kind of brute force that um, you know, Deep Blue used and just search through a lot of positions, or there's a more nuanced version of, of brute force in AlphaGo, um, which combines Monte Carlo tree search, which is kind of classical AI technique, um, with deep learning to do the pattern recognition, um, but still uses an awful lot of data there. And so it's still, as you say, it's an extension um, of, of brute force. But it's an empirical question in each domain about whether that will get you far enough. And it mostly depends on how open-ended the problem is and how many outlier cases there are. So you already, I think, get into trouble with driving. So you know, people thought that by now we would have driverless cars. If you go back to like 2012, um, I wrote a piece in The New Yorker and I thought that it would, you know, they, were, they were legal in three states and I wrote this thing about um, what would happen if a uh, school bus went out of control. And I thought, you know, um, you know do you save the, the children in the school bus? or do you save yourself? I, I thought that you know, by 2020, maybe we would have driverless cars. That was when I was just getting back into AI and didn't understand quite, quite the limits of, of, of the tech at that time. Um, so driverless cars might be solvable just by this kind of brute force, but it's not really looking that way. So the, you know, the, the, the best, right, Waymo's been working on this a, for a decade, and they're, they're the best at it as far as I can tell. And they have what we call an intervention rate of something like 1 in 12,000 miles. Um, that means 1 in 12,000 miles a safety driver has to touch the wheel in order to, to fix something. Um, that sounds good, but humans only have a fatal crash once in every 134 million miles. And the progress doesn't really look exponential. It looks like there's some progress there. But it's possible that we just won't get there. You know, it's, it is an empirical poss you know, question, but it's possible we'll just never get there by collecting more and more data because there's always outlier cases. So there's always going to be something that isn't in your database. So part of the problem with the Teslas crashing into tow trucks is there's not a lot of labeled data of tow trucks on the side of the road. And so you say, okay, I'll manufacture some. I'll take Grand Theft Auto, I will build a simulator, and I will have tow trucks stopped on the side of the road. I'll supplement my data. And people actually do this. But then there's some other case that nobody thought to put in the simulator. And there's just, a f I don't know if it's an endless case, but there's a set of cases, but it's a very broad set of cases, maybe too broad um, to really actually be able to solve it with brute force just by looking for the data. Unless somebody anticipates all the possibilities and, you know, um, 
uh, police officers with hand-lettered signs in emergencies. and all. Unless you anticipate them and have everything in your training set, it's not going to work. And then there are other cases that are even worse than that. So maybe if we're really lucky, we can solve driverless cars with the current techniques. I don't think so, but it's it's open question. Um, then are things like reading. There's just too many different sentences, and this was Chomsky's point, and it's still right. I mean, he made this um, article with, with George Miller in 1963, and it's still totally true, that you just can't beat language with raw statistics, because there's too many sentences with too many meanings. Um, and so, you know, every sentence that I'll say tonight, you've probably never heard before, unless you, maybe you watch me on YouTube and I repeat myself. Um, and so each sentence, you, you know, you won't have a stored label example with the meaning of this sentence. We don't even know how to teach computers exactly what the meanings of sentences are. But even if we did, there's just too vast a space of possibilities. So there are always these outliers, or you can call them edge cases, whatever you like, um, or you can think about the long tail. There's a very long tail of examples. And in problems where that is kind of the essence of what makes them hard, you're in trouble. In problems where there not, aren't that many outlier cases, and you can use self-play as another thing, you can do that in AlphaGo, so you collect arbitrary amounts of data, that's great. But what if you want to list your grandpa with an elder care robot into bed? Well, you can't get 100 million training examples, and we all know that simulators and robots don't entirely mix. That was actually the point, of, the original point of the video that I repurposed there, right? All of the things in that video have been done in simulation, but then you have like, you know, friction in the real world that people don't quite calculate in capture in their simulations and doesn't work anymore. And so there are problems that we just can't solve that way. So of course the next question becomes, okay, so um, what do we do, right? How do we move forward? And I think you touched upon it a little bit at the end, but in the book you, you advocate for a hybrid approach. Uh, Absolutely. That mixes good old fashioned AI and, and deep learning. And, and some other things, too. So, I mean, Marvin Minsky had this notion of a society of minds, that you have lots of different agents in, in your brain doing different things. Um, Danny Kahneman, who will um, be joining me tomorrow um, at Pioneer Works, has this idea of system one and system two. So you have a what I call a reflexive and deliberative system. Um, maybe Minsky overcounted if he thought there was 100, and I think Danny is undercounting if he really thinks there's two, but I think he's just emphasizing those two. Um, but, you know, there, there's a lot of different functions. I had that pie chart as a different way of making this point. There, there are a lot of different components to cognition. And so we have to have a hybrid model. There's just no way that one system is going to do all of these different things. So it is true that ultimately everything um, kind of uh, cashes out in motor control. But before you get to motor control, you have, for example, a linguistic system that is calculating a semantic analysis of every sentence that you hear, which is very different from an object recognition system that's trying to make a coherent uh, interpretation of the scene with all the light that's falling and what the objects could be here. So cognition is just doing a lot of different things. and It's just not realistic to expect a single system. Now, does that mean the hybrid is just deep learning and classical AI? No. Like classical AI had a lot of problems. It wasn't very good at representing statistics. It wasn't very good at representing uncertainty. So we actually give classical AI a hard time in the book. But our editor is like, you can't keep beating up on things. So we had to do it in a <laughs> subtle way. But you know, the, the truth is that the chapter on common sense starts by saying, look, here are some things classical AI, um, not deep learning, does well, um, like taxonomy. So knowing that if a microphone is an object and objects have weight, the, the, you know, a microphone might have weight or something like that. Um, but even that doesn't get you that far. So like an example we had in, in the Times the other day um, was a cheese grater. Like you understand when you look at a cheese grater, not just its three-dimensional shape, which you could put into a game engine, you could have little cars drive through their holes if you wanted to, um, but you understand like why the holes are sharp and why there's a handle on top and, and so forth. And classical AI is not that great at that either. And, and so so um, you know, we're going to need some new techniques. We're going to want what we most need from classical AI is the ability to represent abstract ideas, um, things that are basically like sentences. Maybe not exactly like sentences, but but very close. So, so we can represent relationships, like we can represent what a daughter is by calculating its relationship to to parents and and gender and so forth. And then we can once we know that rule, we can apply it to any new example. So um, classical AI is basically like computer programming. Computer programming is great at having the level of abstraction that allows you to build an internet browser. You would not want to machine learn an internet browser by having labeled examples of the keys people press and the images that are downloaded. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. You need to have algorithms, classical algorithms, to do some of that, to like retrieve things and decide whether a keystroke is hit and so on. It just doesn't make sense to do it with deep learning. Mm -hmm. And AI, you need like every technique that people have used in programming, every technique that people have used in, in deep learning, and then a bunch that we haven't invented yet. So you point the field in in one direction. I mean, towards this hybrid approach. Who's who's already sort of there doing interesting work? I'm like I, 
Like the there, one there's I only a little bit of it right yeah. now. Um, I really like Josh Tenenbaum's work yeah. at MIT. Um, I really don't like the way that Jeff Hinton has been beating up on hybrid models lately. So he has this metaphor, he says it's like Jeff Hinton being one, of the one of the founders of Deep of Learning. Design. He just won the Turing Award. Um, he's the most famous person in, in Deep Learning. He's done some great work, but he's been really discouraging people from doing hybrid models. So he, he spoke at the G7 last year, and he used this analogy. He said it was like taking electric cars and gas cars. So like he says all the you know, old-fashioned AI stuff is like the gasoline engines, and our Deep Learning stuff is like electric cars, and why would you go back? Because Basically. And I think that this is really misleading the field. Um, there's lots of things that classical AI still does better. Um, and like nobody wants their you know, GPS navigation system to be entirely driven by deep learning. They want it to follow a, a nice optimization algorithm that, that we've known for years. So um, I, I think there, there's been a um, political tension since long before I was born. Um, between people who are working on neural networks, deep learning is the latest version of neural networks. They're not really brains, but there's a kind of political advertising that goes behind that I could talk about in the, the questions later. But um, there's this neural network approach, which is kind of fundamentally statistical and data-driven, um, to coin a phrase. Um, and then there's the um, symbolic approach, which is more like classical computer programming. And these People have hated each other since the 50s. They were fighting over grant money for decades. And there is like a pendulum that goes back and forth. And for a while, Hinton was down and now he's back on top. But he remembers being down and he's bitter. And <laughs> you, can, you can watch his stuff on, and, and you'll see what I mean. Which is a not widely shared opinion, right? Like as the fathers of the Oh, yeah, he's totally being celebrated. And he, and he repeated this um, the day he won the award. Somebody said, what about this Gary Marcus and the hybrid models? Um, uh, somebody for Bloomberg. I don't know if it's in print or I just have it in an email. But he's, he gave the same metaphor then. Great. All right, let's open up to questions. I was wondering uh, what you thought of uh, Jeff Hawkins and Numenta, because uh, is he sort of controversial? It, it, it's a nice project. Um, to try to build AI inspired by the brain, but I think it's premature and I have some disputes with the specific way that he does it that we've argued about, you probably find on YouTube somewhere. Um, but, so the, the specific thing that, that we've argued about is a technical point, but an important one. He, he's looking largely for one canonical brain circuit, which is an idea that's been in neuroscience for 40 years. And I like to sometimes quote uh, Bono on this. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Um, if it's there, nobody's been able to identify it. And I don't think that we will find one circuit, but rather many um, variations. So just like the hand and the foot are variations on a theme, I expect that we'll find many different brain circuits that are variations on a theme, because that's how genetics works, through duplication and divergence. My book, The Birth of the Mind, is about that a bit. Um, so. Um, we're going to find many different brain circuits. Looking for one, I think, is a mistake. Um, more broadly, I don't think it's a mistake to want to build AI inspired by the brain, but we don't know enough about the brain yet. And so if you're slavish to the brain, as I think he is, um, you wind up with a problem, which is there are a lot of gaps in our current knowledge. My favorite example is we have a kind of short-term memory where I can tell you something on one trial and you can immediately remember it. If I say I will give a free book to the first person who rushes the stage, you'll all remember. Some of you will think it's a good idea, some of it's a bad idea, I'm not actually doing it, it was just a hypothetical. But if I said it, you know, you'd remember it, you hear it once. Whereas most of the neurosciences about the aplesia and how it retracts its gill over hundreds or thousands of trials, and it's something with the wrong temporal dynamics, the wrong data dynamics, and so forth. And so if you're restricting yourself to what an aplesia does with its gill, a sea slug does with its gill, you're going to wind up with a system that doesn't capture what we do in the course of understanding a sentence. And so 50 years from now, we will know how to build really deeply neurally inspired models. But right now, we have to settle for cognitive science, for psychology, linguistics, fields like that, where we can actually get some insight now before we unravel the brain. I think if we do that correctly, that will actually help us. Um, as, as Thomas said, it's a massive problem to kind of do machine learning on the brain. It's, I think it's outside the scope of what we can do right now, except in, in narrow cases. And so we don't really have the tools to understand the brain yet, so it's not going to help us yet. It's good that Jeff is trying to figure out what he can from it, but we have to be cautious and realize there are such big gaps in our knowledge. Thank you. Let's do one more over there. Yep. Uh, thanks, Gary. Great talk. Um, in terms of uh, limitations to AI, um, there was an article in Newsweek, 1995, that read uh, why the internet will fail, uh, citing uh, people will never trust the internet with their credit cards. Um, how will you make sure that your book doesn't kind of fall in the same bin of history? I mean, I, I can't be sure, but I can tell you that the core argument that I made in the book 
um, in, sorry, in my first book, what I actually first made in 1998, and I carry through here, was that deep learning systems, the predecessors, multi-layer perceptrons, um, were too close to the data and couldn't generalize beyond it. And I gave some specific examples, and I stand by that argument. And some um, wise ass from DeepMind recently thought it would be fun to feed it into the problem that I proposed into GP2. So maybe you can search for Algebraic Mind and Marcus and um, uh, Zergy Lord is his name on Twitter, and you can find this example. And he's like, you know, look, I feed it in, and the system is able to do this example for Marcus, which was a rose is a rose, a tulip is a tulip, a, li a lily is a blank. And the system was, was able to actually fill that in where the older systems couldn't. But I wrote back and I said, well, can it do it with novel words, which is one of the things I actually mentioned back uh, in 98, and can it do it reliably? And he writes back about 20 minutes later sheepishly, well, not really. So, you know, I made that prediction in 1998. We have maybe thousands of times more computation available and billions of times more data than I was able to use in the experiments, but the prediction is still right. I may be proven wrong. I suspect that what will actually happen is that people will start to incorporate hybrid models and not call them that. We've already seen a bit of that. So like DeepMind made a big deal of AlphaGo as a deep learning system, but it has this Monte Carlo tree search stuff that precedes deep learning that was, comes from classical AI. It's an important part of it. So there'll be some rebranding in the way that IBM rebranded Watson. So first Watson was a specific tool that played Jeopardy and had particular structure. You can read about in a great set of articles and a really interesting system. Um, and then suddenly it was everything. I wrote a New Yorker article about Watson and his chef, the first thing that they told me when I went to do the article was, well, it's not actually Watson. It's two guys on their lunch break doing some Bayesian analysis on, on recipes. It had nothing really to do with Watson. And then, so I wrote about this in New York, and then three weeks later, um, IBM relabeled everything in their cognitive uh, portfolio, or nearly so, um, as, as um, you know, part of Watson. So everything will be called deep learning because it has an element in it, but the symbol manipulation people, the classical AI people, should be just entitled. They should be able to say, AlphaGo is a symbol manipulating system because it uses symbol manipulation um, for, for the um, tree search stuff. So that's just semantics. I think that to actually get things to work, you need to have fundamentally um, operations over variables, which are critical to computers and, and why I called that first book, The Algebraic Mind. And I will stand by that, and maybe I will be proven wrong, but it's been a good bet so far. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful.